Wilcox got a problem with his voice at the moment. And so he has brought in a friend who's also um, a very uh, accomplished philosopher. And his name is John Shandler, and he's come to be a reader. So we are, we are a, a bit spoiled tonight in terms of uh, you know, having someone who's an expert in their field uh, visit us. Now, the person who's going to be putting across the other point of view is our very own Kevin Rogers, who has been the one who has lovingly established this group and, and provided this forum, and, and we're very grateful to, for him for all that he's done in that. He, well, I'm sure. So is that all right to say, Kevin, or have I just gone on a bit too much there? Say no more. Say no more. <laughs> uh, my intention in writing Western Values versus the Gospels was to show that values central to modern liberal democracies are not grounded in the values endorsed by Jesus in the Gospels. However, an alternative understanding of the title is that the book is out to show that Western values should be preferred to those of the Gospels, and I'll argue for both conclusions in this talk. So what do we mean by Western values? Over the past 200 years or so, there's been a marked tendency in how Western nations have performed their laws. This tendency has been towards an increase in the freedom of individuals to pursue their own conception of what's valuable, provided this is compatible with legal freedom for others. There's also been a tendency towards recognition of all individuals as equal citizens with respect to the political system. These tendencies have these tendencies have manifested themselves in a commitment to the separation of church and state, uh, to liberal and pluralist parliamentary democracy, to a toleration of racial, cultural and lifestyle diversity, equality of the sexes, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, and so on. What underlies this list is the notion that each human is of equal intrinsic worth. That is, each is equally valuable and none derives their value from any source outside of themselves. People are, in Kant's words, ends in themselves and not mere means for achieving the ends of anyone else. What then are the values contained in the Gospels? Much of what Jesus offers as advice in the Gospels is what I call operational advice. It's not advice about what to do to be saved. He does, of course, also offer such salvational advice, which mostly consists of following the Ten Commandments and the laws of the prophets and avoiding the 13 unclean things. Uh, his operational advice, by contrast, is his message about the tactics to adopt to make sure that the salvation message is spread as quickly as possible. Jesus clearly believes that the end of the old order of things is imminent to occur in the lifetimes of those he's talking to. He also advises of what hampers the spread of the message. This is the point of advice like turn the other cheek, or don't take each other to court, or give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, or concentrate your preaching on Paul. These are not things you need to do to be saved, but things you need to do to maximise the spread of the message. The one overriding value that the Jesus of the Gospels is committed to is the supremacy of God. Only God is good, only God has intrinsic worth, that is, has value as an end in himself. The goodness of anything else is a function of its relation to the will of God. Humans then have value insofar as they serve the will of God. Now one of the things that God desires is the good of human beings. This good lies, the good of human beings lies in their devotion to and worship of God, the God who made them. God wants people to worship him out of a genuine appreciation of his magnanimity. To acknowledge that he did not have to create them and that his doing so was an act of grace, generosity and love. This worship involves following God's commandments, namely the law of Moses and the prophets, which Jesus sees as summed up in two commandments. Uh, firstly, love the Lord thy, your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. And secondly, love your neighbour as yourself. Humans who do this thereby fulfil their nature and lead the best kind of life possible for 
for a human being. Now the crucial difference between Western values and those of the Gospels is that the West sees human, uh, individual humans as an equal intrinsic worth. Jesus believes that God is out to give individual, uh, sorry, Jesus however sees them as merely equal in, instrumental worth. Jesus believes that God is out to give individual humans eternal life and God wants to do this the maximum number of people possible, provided they repent and commit themselves to genuine worship and obedience. God is indifferent to which humans worship him. He doesn't discriminate on the basis of race or sex or age or previous sins. As St. Paul puts it, Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. However, they lose the value God has conferred on them if they do not come to love and obey God in the way he desires, by the time they die or by the deadline of the day of judgment. They also lose it if they blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, Mark 3.29, or if once they put their hands to the plough, they turn back, Luke 9.61-62. There is no such loss of value on the Western account equal worth is inalienable. What is it then for people to be of equal intrinsic worth? As we've seen, an important part of it is that people should be free to live their lives according to their own conception of good life, provided this is compatible with an equal freedom for everyone else. Murder, for example, can't be part of the conception of a good life, because anyone who uses murder as a means to his or her ends does so on the assumptions, assumption that other people don't have equal freedom to murder. murder Whatever he gains by murder can be taken from him by murder if everyone is free to commit murder. Now, one aspect of the good life is living in accord with your own religion. In order for this to be a freedom that is compatible with equal freedom for everyone, it has to be the case that people can't, cannot ban another person religion on the grounds that it contradicts their own religion. They have to be tolerant of religious diversity, of the uh, right of people to change their religion or to have no religion at all. If I can ban your religion on the basis of a revelation which is private to me as an individual, revelation to me, uh, then as you are of equal intrinsic worth, you can ban my religion on the basis of the revelation that is private to you. Which religion ends up being banned then is determined solely by who has the greater power and to decide a matter solely on the basis of who has the greatest power is not a case of respecting the equal worth of people. When it comes to drawing up the rules to govern a society then, we can't appeal to those aspects of our religion that derive from revelation unless these can also be supported by consideration, considerations that are common to all the parties, regardless of their particular revelation. Namely, the common currency of evidence, publicly available to everyone, such as the testimony of the censors and uh, standards of sound reasoning. To force others to lose freedoms because of revelation that can't be justified to them, in terms of evident public available to them, is to act as if you had superior access to truth, as if you had greater than equal intrinsic worth, and the others had less than equal intrinsic worth, as if one were a special worth and not of equal worth. Now, the justification that Jesus offers for why people should live according to his values is either that God has revealed these to him, or else that he has faith in the revelation given to Moses and the prophets. He doesn't seek, does not seek to justify his claims in terms of evidence that is accessible to anyone, whatever they have faith, whether they have faith in these revelations or not. It is at this point that things Jesus values have the derivation in a source entirely distinct from the basis for Western Uh, it may 
even be the case that the equal value placed by Jesus on all humans as people worthy of salvation, as potential members of the kingdom of God, was a kind of evolutionary step in the development of the Enlightenment idea of the equal intrinsic worth of all people. It may have been a step towards that. But that doesn't make it the same idea. The Jews themselves seem to have an idea along these lines, seeing God's relationship with themselves as part of God's plan to benefit all the nations, presumably equally, as indicated in Isaiah 2 4, where it says, He will judge between the nations and settle and will settle disputes for many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares, then their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. The Muslims too seem to treat all humans as of equal worth, so far as the potential for salvation is concerned. Nevertheless, all these religions don't see people as of equal intrinsic worth, of value independently of whether there is a God or not. And it's this that makes the values of enlightenment so different from the values of went before. They're not God dependent, they're the worst. So much then for whether the values of the West have a Judeo-Christian basis. They don't. It might be thought that the Ten Commandments express the values of the West, but in fact most of the values that the ten, uh, in the Ten Commandments are the values of any viable society. Uh, for instance, prohibitions against murder, theft, slander, uh, and most societies arrived at similar prohibitions independently of a knowledge of Jews and Christians. Those commandments requiring belief in the Jewish God, that the banning of images and not working on the Sabbath, are the result of special revelation which does not provide the kind of justification required if people are to be treated as a people of intrinsic worth. They are not outcomes that people are likely to agree to as a result of reasoning with each other on the basis of information publicly available to all of them. Nonetheless, even though the values of the West are not the same as those of Jesus, it may well be the case that Jesus has the better values. Is this so? One of the dominant values endorsed in the Gospels is love. But what exactly does Jesus mean by love? The Oxford Dictionary defines it as, quote, that state of feeling with regard to a person that arises from recognition of attractive qualities, from, from sympathy or natural ties, and manifests itself in warm affection and attachment. What, however, are the qualities that Jesus recognises in a person as attractive that arouse his sympathy? The quality that matters most to him is that they've repented and have committed themselves to living a life in accordance with God's will, out of gratitude for uh, 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 that God has brought them into existence. Consequently, when he tells us to love our neighbour, what he wants us to do is to persuade them to repent out of gratitude to God. If we love ourselves, we will also want to repent out of gratitude to God. So, loving our neighbour as ourselves is seeking to convert our neighbour to seeing the world as Jesus sees it. The word love, how we going to the time? Word love. The word love is one of a number of words I call processor words. They have a very general meaning that doesn't tell you whether or not they apply to a particular example until you know the theoretical orientation of the person using the word, until you know how the word has been Process. For Jesus, you will not have properly loved your neighbour unless you try to convert them. His notion of love has this very specific content. By contrast, if what counts for you as the most attractive quality of a person is that they have intrinsic value equal to your own, then loving them will involve your treating them accordingly. He has no necessary connection to the creating of Christianity or Islam or any other religion for that matter. 
rather involves recognising that they are the ones who made decisions about what life was best for them, and provided they respect the equal right of others to do the same, giving them the freedom to live up to life. That's the attractive quality of a person. But, uh, um, it may well be that living a Christian life is the one they choose, but it's not one they would seek to impose on others, although they may well wish to persuade people to willingly and freely adopt their religion. And Western values are quite compatible with the liberal practice of religion. It is only the illiberal or anti-liberal forms of religion that it rejects. It's not clear from the Gospels whether Jesus has a liberal or anti-liberal attitude to religion. He nowhere says that people should be forced to agree with him, but he is rather too fond of condemning his opponents to hell, where there will be gnashing of teeth. Uh, he's rather, I should have said, rather too fond of condemning his opponents to hell, where there will be gnashing of teeth, for us to feel entirely reassured on the matter. Jesus tells us to do unto others what we would have them do to unto us. Here again, we need to think through what Jesus means by such a claim. From his point of view, there's only one thing we would want to do to others, namely, for them to get us to repent our sins and obey God out of gratitude, supporting us when we weaken, protecting us from temptation, fortifying our resolve. So, given that this is what we would want them uh, uh, to do for us, then we should do this for them by By contrast, if, we, if what we want others to do is to treat us as if we were rational agents of equal intrinsic worth, then according to Western values, we should treat them as so. The first of the Beatitudes expresses the value of being poor in spirit. That's Matthew 5, 3. The Zondervan Bible suggests that what Jesus values here is regarding your access to the Kingdom of Heaven as a gift rather than as a reward. You shouldn't think of yourself as entitled to anything from God, that salvation is not your right, even if you live your life entirely in accord with God's commands. God is under no obligation to any of, its, any of his creation. One should display spiritual humility, not spiritual pride. Certain kind of spiritual pride, by contrast, is compatible with Western values. They endorse the kind of pride where you require that an adequate level of evidence be offered before you accept a claim. That's a kind of respect for yourself as a rational being. That's my observation. Um, they endorse... Uh, it is one of our duties as responsible members of a democratic society not to believe a claim on the basis of whim, comfort, convenience, peer pressure, or mere personal preference, rather to believe a claim but only because there are sufficient reasons of a truth relevant nature to think it true. There is, however, spiritual humili humility also involved in this. You should not regard yourself as an authority on a subject unless you put in suitable effort to master the relevant evidence. And the mere fact that you have an unchangeable feeling that you're right is not enough. Another value in the Gospels is that of peace. In the seventh beatitude, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. That is, uh, there's an interesting question here as to whether whether Christ means that anyone who makes peace, who contributes to the existence of a more peaceful society in the world, is to be regarded as having done something valuable, and therefore deserved, deserving to be called Son of God. Such an intention doesn't seem to be in character with the rest of what he says. A more plausible interpretation is that he means, blessed are those who do what will bring about God's peace. That is a particular kind of peace that Jesus regards as his own. His belief, I suggest, is that when the kingdom of God comes, then there will be peace. Not any old, not any old kind of peace, but the right kind. All the troublemaking disbelievers will have been eliminated, so there will be no opposition to God's rule. Christ's use of Peace, then, is a processed use. Uninterpreted in the context uh, 
of the particular theory pertains to just means freedom from war or some such. Interpreted as Jesus does, peace has a particular content. It's a state of lawlessness brought about by the fact that all those who have survived God's winnowing process are in agreement in what they value most, namely genuinely worshipping God and obeying his laws. In the same way, we could give peace an Islamic interpretation by saying that peace is achieved when a state of lawlessness comes about because Allah and his earthly agents have eliminated everyone except those who are in agreement that the only thing of value is genuinely worshipping Allah and severely, sincerely obeying the laws he transmitted to Muhammad. This claim has actually been made by the Indonesian Muslim cleric, Abu Bakr Bashir, who has declared that if we were all Muslims, then there would be peace. In other words, there would be no non-Muslims in the world to motivate Islamic extremist terrorist attacks. Western values also interpret the notion of peace in the context of a theory about which absence of war is a truly uh, uh, desirable state. The Western ideal is peace between people who may disagree on the conceptions of the good life and their beliefs about what's known by revelation, but who tolerate these differences insofar as it is compatible with the equal intrinsic worth of each person. Christ's ideal, by contrast, does not treat all people as equal intrinsic worth. Instead, he thinks it was a good thing if all people who disagreed with his conceptions of good were eventually eliminated, even though he and his followers are unable to show that they have some special access to the truth about the correct conception of the good. As it happens then, Western values accommodate those values of Jesus that are compatible with treating people as of equal intrinsic value. In Western societies, Christians are free to live their lives in accordance with the Christian revelation, but are not free to impose the requirements of that revelation on those that haven't experienced that revelation for themselves. Western society requires that the Christian revelation be given no more authority over what people are forced to do under the law than the revelation of any other religion. This has not always been so in the West. For example, one of the values Jesus eh, endorses most vehemently is the prohibition on divorce unless one's partner is committed to adultery. Um, Matthew 5.31 Even then he forbids both the guilty and the innocent partners from remarrying. Matthew 5.32 These requirements operated within the Western world uh, until quite recently and caused immense misery. They were not requirements based on public evidence available to all members of society about the costs and benefits of the laws, but were based entirely on what Jesus believed had been revealed, either to him or to Moses and the prophets. It wasn't a law that could be reasoned about and modified in the light of analysis and its effects. As I said above, nothing stops a committed Christian from living in accord with Revelation refusing to marry a divorced person, for example, but this revelation should not be the basis of the law, the law of the land. Instead, the law should be something negotiated between the differing beliefs and conceptions of the good in our society to produce a result that respects all participants as of equal intrinsic worth. Jerry mentioned that I'm going to present an entirely different view and uh, disagree with a lot of what you said, because in fact, a lot of what you said I do agree with. Sorry. Um, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, so uh, I won't try and uh, uh, rebut any of the points that you've made during my talk. I'm prepared to talk, and then uh, later on after supper we'll have a discussion. We can talk over those issues then. So Jesus and Western values. Uh, first of all, uh, get some terms clear. What are values? So you can have uh, two types of values, and they, these are the value of things, or moral values. So when we're talking about things or beings, we, we may refer to God. What's the value of God? What's the value of a human being? A controversial thing, what's the uh, value of an unborn baby or a fetus? What's the value of animals, such as dogs and cats? Or what's the value of trees and vegetation? 
or the earthly universe. So these are things, and we're saying, what is the value of a thing or a being? The other type of value that we talk about are moral values. So what are your moral values? How do we act? So uh, what is important to you is determining what is right and good. Like is it respect for other people, or telling the truth, or loving others? So you have two types of values, the value of something, or the va uh, moral values that determine how you act. Um, Peter and John uh, talked about um, intrinsic and instrumental values. So an intrinsic value is something that is valuable of itself. Whereas an instrumental value is something that's only valuable to actually support an intrinsic value. For instance, money is not intrinsically valuable. It's only valuable because it can do something that you want, which you actually have a higher value on. So you can have a whole pile of money in your hand, but it won't make you happy in itself. Now, um, I have nothing against the idea of uh, intrinsic and instrumental values. I think it's perfectly true. And they uh, have a, a lovely illustration of this in 1 Corinthians 13, which is Paul's um, passage on love. Uh, and this is often um, recited at Christian weddings or sometimes even uh, secular weddings as well. So I'll read it to you. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels that do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So there the intrinsic value is love. And other things that may be good, such as prophecy, faith, self-sacrifice, they are only of instrumental value. If they are not supported by love, they're worthless. And Paul goes on to actually define what he means by love. So we've had uh, your definition of love, but this is what he, uh, what he defines love as. Love is patient, Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Um, Peter Walcott has uh, written this book, Western Values versus the Gospels, what Jesus really values and why we should, shouldn't agree with him. The, and the book claims that uh, only God has intrinsic value and people only have value if they follow God. Jesus seeks to involve, in, enforce his values on us against our will and Jesus commands us to obey him without giving sufficient reason or evidence. Regarding Western values, the claim is that Western values are based on the Enlightenment rather than on Jesus, and they are based on reason and evidence, um, and that individuals have intrinsic value for themselves, they don't have uh, necessarily instrumental value, and that Western values are actually better than Jesus' values. I hope that's a reasonable reflection of what you're saying. So that was his claim. And um, the a key, this is, I believe, is his uh, key argument. Uh, it comes down to what uh, do you mean by good? Um, and this is a, he quotes this verse. He says, A man ran up to Jesus and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replies, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And from this verse, or as it seems apparent to me, is the basis where uh, Peter says only God is good, and he equates good with intrinsic value. So he's saying that only God has intrinsic value. And uh, after that, uh, he uh, interprets everything in that light. So he, uh, G, he believes, says that Jesus believes that only God has intrinsic value, and people have instrumental value. And don't have intrinsic value. 
So everything thereafter in the book is interpreted, interpreted through this lens. And so we get the impression that Jesus is a very narrow view of human value, and Peter interprets all of Jesus' acts and sayings through this narrow lens. And it makes Jesus look very bad. Now, that's just a way of introducing Peter's argument and defining some terms. Uh, this is uh, my structure of what I'm going to talk about. So, what are Jesus' values? It's the first part. Then I'm going to give you a complete history of the Western culture in five minutes. <laughs> and then look at the values in Western culture. Um, Peter agrees that Jesus' values are firmly embedded, embedded in the Old Testament. And so we're right if we go back and look at what the Old Testament says and say Jesus must have uh, believed something similar to that. So um, we can turn to chapter 1 of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. And it uh, goes through the description of God creating the world. So, creating sun, moon, and stars, or earth, sun, moon, and stars, sea, and land, vegetation, animals, and finally human beings. And each time uh, God created something, He said it was good. All right. And then when He created the whole lot, He said, God saw that all that He had made, and it was very good. All right. So, if we take Peter's definition of good then everything has value. And also it says that when he created human beings, it said God created man and a kind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So human beings are quite special in all of creation. So I think we can fairly say that Jesus would have inherited that belief. Also, here's another critical passage out of the psalm, Psalm 8. And here's what it says. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. Like, place next to the stars, moon and whatever, we look pretty small, don't we? But it says, yeah, you've made them a little lower than the angels. Peter and John have already mentioned, mentioned the two greatest commandments. So this is specifically from Jesus. Um, so somebody came up to him and said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And note, and he says, the second is like it. All right? Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So these are intrinsic commandments. All right? So he says, everything else hangs on it. Everything else might be instrumental. These are intrinsic. Mm -hmm. And also the golden rule. Do to others what you would have them do to you. So this sums up all the laws and the prophets. Now, uh, he had a particular interpretation of what that meant. Um, that, it, you know, you're out to save other people, get them into the kingdom. Uh, but in practice, I don't interpret it that way. And I don't think uh, many other people here would as well. Uh, that uh, common everyday things also matter, such as being polite and uh, respecting other people telling the truth, etc. So, are humans valuable? Um, uh, Jesus talks about sparrows. He says, are not five sparrow, sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So we're worth, worth more than many sparrows, but even the sparrows have value. So, love also is not narrowly focused on just those who are in the church, so to speak. Uh, because Jesus says, you've heard it said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. 
So here's my summary of Jesus' values. All human beings are made in the image of God. And the most important commandments are to love God and the people we meet. And we should treat others as we would like to be treated. And love applies even to those who hate us. And all human beings are extremely valuable. Okay, now you get to get the history of the West in five minutes. So I'm going to uh, cover the early church, Constantine, fall of Rome, rise of Islam, Charlemagne, Genghis Khan, Reformation, modern science, enlightenment, and now modern democracy. Um, we've had a, a little bit of exposure to Jesus. So uh, Jesus uh, was on this planet from 4 BC through to around about 30 AD. And then uh, after that period, we had what the, we call the apostolic era, where the apostles kind of spread the message and they testified to what they had seen and heard uh, amongst the, within the Roman Empire. From uh, around about 64 AD to 313, Christianity was actually officially illegal. Um, and there were persecutions at various times. And so um, a lot of Christians lost their lives simply for believing in Christ. And this happened until 313, when there was an edict in the land which made uh, Christianity legal. And the key figure who brought this on was a man called Constantine, who became Roman em emperor. He defeated his opponent called Maxentius under the sign of the cross. And he had the sign of the cross on his shields, and he won, he beat Maxentius. He thought, this looks pretty good. <laughs> And so he was far more uh, favorably disposed towards Christianity. And so we had the edict of Milan in 313 where Christianity was legalized within the Roman Empire. Um, later on, uh, Constantine chaired the Council of Nicaea, which was the first universal church council. And uh, later on, he did something very critical. He moved the central government from Rome to Constantinople in is it in Turkey or Greece? So the other side, I mean. It's with the Roman Empire. The map on the right shows the extent of the Roman Empire. So it covered uh, North Africa, uh, a lot of the uh, southern part of Europe, and the Middle East. Um, but the Roman Empire started to weaken. And in uh, 410, Rome was sacked by, I think it was Alaric. Uh, so they were part of the Judean tribes that came to the north. And the last emperor who was actually in Rome itself was in 476. But the Roman Empire actually continued on in Constantinople through to 1453. So uh, the Germanic tribes didn't stay in Rome, they kind of retreated and went back. And the only, the question was, okay, who's in charge of Rome? And the only group around that actually could unify everybody was the church. And so the church and the bishop at Rome grew in power after that time. Later on, uh, we had Muhammad between 570 and 632. And um, after his death, uh, we have the expansion of the Arab Empire. And so the, uh, their forces conquered the Middle East, North Africa, West Africa, and even Spain. And the Muslim expansion was stopped at Constantinople and also at the Battle of Tours in France by a, a man called Charles the Hammer. Um, and he was the um, grandfather of the next figure. But um, this is quite significant because, of course it's significant, um, because um, the uh, Muslim Empire blocked access of the European or Western uh, Roman Empire from getting into the East. Um, Charlemagne was the uh, grandson of uh, uh, Charles the Hammer. He became king of the Franks, which is France, in 768. An interesting thing, he was crowned emperor of the Holy Roman Empire by Pope Leo III. So you have the ruler of Europe being crowned by the Pope. So the Pope is kind of enhancing his state status and becoming the power on the throne. Another interesting thing about Charlemagne he actually started converting by force. So he conquered the Germanic tribes and he forced them to convert to Christianity. Pope Leo had some reservations about this, but Charlemagne 
reassured him, said, don't worry, you do your job, and I'll do mine. <laughs> um, but he uh, uh, united most of Western Europe and kind of enforced the conversion of Christianity among the Germanic tribes. A few years later, we have the rise of the Mongol Empire. So Genghis Khan was founded the Mongol Empire, and he smashed everybody we came across. Never lost. All right, he decimated China. He went into the northern part of Europe and conquered uh, Georgia and wiped out a hum arm of 50,000 soldiers who were promised to support the Crusades, by the way. And so the Queen had to send an apologetic letter. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't send you my, my troops, they're all gone. Um, but uh, also what they did is they, uh, they hit the Muslim Empire far more than they did the West. And they uh, sacked Baghdad in 1258 at that time, and they had a huge amount of learning in Baghdad. And um, this kind of signaled the end of the golden era of Islam. Uh, later on, um, he kind of uh, partitioned out his empire, his uh, grandsons fought amongst themselves, and the Mongol Empire contracted. And everybody was very happy about that. But what actually happened, he weakened both China and the Muslim uh, Empire, and before that, they were probably bigger, more powerful than the West. But having sacked and decimated these kingdoms, it left the West in a more powerful position. In um, 1517, we have a movement called the Reformation. And um, in 1517, uh, Martin Luther placed a post of 95 theses on a church door. Within a week, all Germany knew. Within a fortnight, all Europe knew. On those theses. And uh, so he was challenging the authority of the Pope. Sorry? He went viral. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But probably even the more significant thing he did was to actually translate the Bible into the German language, into the vernacular, so everybody could read it for themselves. And uh, later on, John Calvin came along, he had systematized the Protestant theology. But by actually uh, he encouraged people to read the Bible for themselves and also to interpret it for themselves. And as far as the Catholic Church was concerned, this was extremely dangerous. And they were right, too. Had uh, a right, uh, the rising of uh, various movements who did all sorts of crazy things because they had their own special revelation. And there were wars uh, that went on. And what actually happened is um, you had Protestant dukes and Catholic dukes. And uh, basically, if you lived under their region, that defined your religion. So if you had a Protestant Jew, you're a Protestant. If you had a Catholic, one, you're a Catholic. Later on, we have the rise of science. And um, here's some key figures in uh, the, science, the movement of science. This is Copernicus. He proposed that the uh, sun rotated around the Earth rather than the other way around. Uh, Galileo invented the telescope. Um, sorry? I think he said that he proposed the sun goes around the earth, wasn't it the other way around? I always thought it was strange. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the correct answer? <laughs> uh, we live on a planet? Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> no, the earth rotates around the sun rather than the sun going around the earth. Sorry. All right. Galileo is a uh, figure down here. He invented the telescope and supported Copernicus' view. Um, they, but they, both these men believed that uh, everything moved in circles. Then along came Kepler, and uh, he um, proposed that things didn't move in circles, they moved in ellipses. And that actually made a whole lot more sense to the motion of the planets. And then along came Isaac Newton, and uh, he gave us the law of gravity, which explained why things moved in ellipses. But no, all these four people were Christians, and the uh, origin of the scientific movement was mainly a Christian movement. Now we get on to the Enlightenment, which is the movement that uh, Peter and John mentioned. Uh, the Enlightenment was roughly from 1650 through to 1800, and I've got uh, five figures here. That's Rene Descartes, this is Gottfried Leibniz, this is John Locke, this is Bishop George Berkeley, and David Hume. This guy is Immanuel Kant. Um, Immanuel Kant uh, defined the Enlightenment 
That's the period when people started to think. Now that's a bit rude, don't you reckon? <laughs> I, think, I think people before that would have actually thought. Uh, but what he really meant is to think in a different way. Uh, the Enlightenment was actually split into two movements called rationalism and empiricism. So rationalism, rationalism is the use of reason alone. So uh, you can actually derive truth from some foundational truths that you can't deny and try and derive uh, other truths just by reason. And empiricism was saying you can't use reason alone, you have to use experience or your senses. So uh, John Locke said we're born as a blank sheet. We've got five senses in the brain. We process what we see and we find out things about the real, real world. So René Descartes was a man who said I think, therefore I am. And he is uh, called the father of rationalism and the father of modern philosophy. And uh, Gottfried Lieb Leibniz was also a rationalist. And uh, John Locke uh, said we can't find out about the real world. Then uh, a guy called Bishop George Berkeley said, um, actually, you don't really know about the real world. All we experience are our senses. So, um, so we don't actually experience the outside world, we just experience our senses. So we don't know that really there is a real world there. And uh, it's been said of George Berkeley, no one has ever believed him, but no one has ever proved he was wrong. Uh, David Hume said, Berkeley's right. And he kind of went down a path of extreme skepticism. Now this man, Emmanuel Kant, um, tried to unite or reconcile the two movements of empiricism and rationalism. And uh, he wrote a book called The Critique of Pure Reason. And he said pure reason is unreliable. The trouble is most of his critique is pure reason. Mm. And he made several mistakes, which just goes to show he was right. Um, but anyway, all that's uh, pretty interesting, but I'd like to focus on this guy and this guy. So John Locke and David Hume. John Locke tried to actually derive morality from reason, uh, from reason alone, uh, or reason and evidence. And uh, so he said, oh, all this uh, stuff that we get revealed in the Bible is fair enough, uh, but we should actually be able to derive the same sort of stuff from uh, using our reason and experience. And a lot of the things that he established became foundational. By the way, uh, John Locke was a good Christian man. And if we go back to the previous slides, all these guys here were Christians, except for this man he was very different. Um, so uh, when we actually say our values are uh, derived from the enlightenment, rather than our, uh, from uh, the Christian movement, you should kind of bear in mind that the Enlightenment was actually picked off by Christians. Um, John Locke um, promoted the ideas of life, liberty, and private property ownership. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, he was very influential on France and also on America. And so a lot of his stuff would kind of be incorporated and modified by people in those countries. And so it's a basis of the American Declaration of Independence. Um, Hume, Hume is uh, interesting because he is saying, uh, actually, this guy's venture is wrong. Yeah, and he came up with this conclusion you cannot get an ought from an is. What that means is you can't actually derive values from your reason and from your experience. So it kind of leaves you with the question of, well, what then is the basis of our values? So after the Enlightenment, you had the rise of democracies. We had the separation of church and state, and religion became a matter of personal choice, choice rather than being forced on you. And we had the decline of the power and the influence of the church. And that's roughly where we are now. All right, so that's, you have the history of the West. Uh, now, what are Western values? And again, I'll divide it into two types. We have Western values that are enshrined in the law, and 
Another thing is kind of popular and cultural values, what people actually personally value. So I, I agree with the, a lot of what um, has been said before. Um, the legal values emphasise everybody's equality before the law. And uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So we try to maximise the freedom that people have. Now, are they better than Jesus' values? Well, I think it's like comparing apples with oranges. The legal values provide a framework for individual choices. It says, here, I'll give a second, uh, basic framework, give that uh, person uh, some basic restrictions, but you go your own way, you make your own choices, you develop your life according to your own choices. So, um, so I'm quite happy with that, I think it's a good idea. Um, but, uh, like, so Jesus' values operate within the culture and the legal framework. So uh, they're not against that framework, they work within it. So the, uh, and they're kind of more personal or communal or something, but it's just one way in which we express our choices within that legal framework. Then the other thing is popular values. So the question is, who do Westerners really follow? Do they follow you or Madonna? You don't have a chance, do you? <laughs> <laughs> do they follow the thinker? Or do they follow celebrities? People like sportsmen, movie stars, lobby groups. The way that uh, values, popular values, are developed in the West are pretty flimsy, really, mm -hmm. and Western values just drift. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like David Hume says, you cannot get an or from an is. And so, what you actually end up following is human sentiment. What are the views of other cultures? Are Western values actually respected by other cultures at all? <laughs> In fact, uh, other cultures would probably consider Western values to be corrupt, very immoral, materialistic. Spend that time watching TV. And so we have the famous last words, don't shoot us, we are Americans. <laughs> um, Americans might think that they're respected by the world, but the rest of the world may not think that way. And other people from other cultures may not think that the West is great as what we do. So Jesus and culture, there are two uh, aspects. Christians will always be a minority within each culture. And Christianity is not just in the West, but will build the earth. So I support these uh, uh, claims of these two statements. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. So Jesus had the expectation that, as history worked out, only minority of people would truly listen to what he said. But he also had uh, this other um, expectation that despite of all, all this be a minority movement, it would still fill the whole earth. Because he says, this gospel of the king will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. So we have this model that Christians will always be a minority within their cultures, and they will be operate within their cultures, but not actually dominate them. The interesting thing about these two statements is that's in fact how things worked out. And I think it's quite an interesting point to wonder how did he know. So in conclusion, in Jesus' eyes, all creation has value. And people are the most valuable part of God's creation. Democratic structures and the liberty of the individual were developed during the Enlightenment, but they still had strong Christian roots. Christian values are not the same as Western values. I agree with that. Uh, but Christian values can actually ha happily operate within Western culture, or any culture, really. And it's not restricted to the West. Just an interesting quote that's worth thinking about from G.K. Chesterton. The next best thing to being really inside Christendom is really being outside Christendom. Um, well, I, I don't know about you guys, but I really enjoyed both talks tonight. I, um, I, I, I think it was, yeah, both, both, both talks um, really did justice to their points of views and, um, and, and I, I learned something from both. Um, and so now we have 
a chance to have a discussion and we can um, ask questions and hopefully even those people who don't normally speak up as much will feel free to, to ask their questions. I do know that some people, um, uh, especially from, not from an English background, maybe have a few more questions um, to ask of Peter just in terms of um, uh, perhaps restating simply some of the, the ideas. But um, yeah, who, who would like to start? Well, uh, I suggest actually, would you like to say a few words at this stage? Oh, sure. uh, in, in whatever you like, um, but um, <coughs> if you've got any kind of comments or questions of what I've said. Okay. Um, I, I apologise for not being able to talk to you properly because I've had this operation, so with a bit of that, you'll understand me all right. Are you doing okay so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, good. Um, all right, so just a few points um, in relationship to what Kevin has said. Um, I suppose the thing I need to stress is that when I talk about whether Christian values are better than Enlightenment values, I'm really talking about um, the sorts of values that operate at the very basis of our society and that hold our society together. So what's crucial for the way we relate to each other, what really is the overriding value, it presumably has to be this respect for each other as an equal intrinsic worth and being prepared to tolerate diverse religions because each holder of these different religions is an equally worthwhile human being as someone who holds a different religion. And those religions are based on revelation. Revelation can't be the basis for the, um, the laws and structures of society. Um, this doesn't mean that the revelation shan't be judged to how people live their personal lives within a law that shows tolerance. But what overrides the revelation is a respect for tolerance. People can be persuaded by revelation but should not be forced by revelation. So that was a, the major sort of point I was making when it came to talking about which was better. I don't have a problem with that at all. Yeah. <laughs> it seems to me that um, you have to distinguish what's said in the Gospels from what Christianity has developed over the period of its history. Um, a lot of the more tolerant aspects of Christianity have come from the need for different groups within Christianity to put forward rules and proposals to ensure their own survival. So when you're a minority, one of a number of minority Christian um, denominations, each of which is struggling to survive from being suppressed by all of the others, you're going to run a line of tolerance. Yeah. And this is very much the story of the years after the Reformation. Now whether that comes out of being in a difficult situation or whether it comes mm -hmm. from Christian doctrine is another matter altogether. Mm -hmm. When you go back to the, to the Gospels, there is no doubt, in my mind anyway, mm -hmm. that Jesus sees the world made up of sins and jokes. There are those who are going to be saved and those who are going to ultimately be condemned. And why are they condemned? It's not because Jesus has any idea that forever they have the same value as the sheep. The goats cease to have the value that the sheep have when they die or when the day of judgment comes. They are to be condemned and they are to be treated in the same respect. It's, he's not operating a policy in principle. I mean, he's not in a position to enforce this policy in the, in the real world. But the whole attitude there is an attitude of intolerance, ultimately. These people are able to teach as well as the, the, the jokes can teach as well as the sheep. They have the same intelligence. They're made in the same image of God. They have made different choices in terms of different judgments. 
And the consequence of that is that I do say that I do. And, and after death and not by any of our judgments. Oh, but Only by death. their creator's judgment. Oh, but what happens to them after death is another matter. This way. hasn't been mentioned all this. Do you believe in the devil? Me? Yeah. Well, I don't believe in John, so I'm not as a man in the devil. <laughs> because that, if that completely, you completely miss the point that the world view of Christians is a two opposing forces. Satan's people. Well, that's not what I'm told. No, no, that's not the view of all Christians. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, it's the biblical view, actually. No, we'll, we'll, we'll I just said, let, let, can, let Steve yeah. finish making yeah, points, right? Yeah, I will, but I'm saying Steve, it's not the view of everybody. Sorry. That, you know, I don't like people talking for all Christians. Just, I'm sorry. I'm talking yeah. for the Bible. Yeah. No, you're here. <laughs> sorry, that, that's, the, that, that's where I'll talk from. Look, you know, there is, as I understand from my teaching, what I've been sort of mentioned by Jesus, yes, there are two opposing forces. Do you accept that that's the teaching? I'm, I'm quite happy with that as an interpretation of the Gospels. In fact, it seems to be blatantly obvious that that's what the Gospels are saying, um, or Jesus is saying in the Gospels. Um, and the upshot of that is if you really believe there is um, the force of God, who is good, and the force of the devil, who is bad, and those who do not choose to worship God according to the way Jesus thinks they should, have been corrupted by the devil and therefore deserve punishment, deserve to be, um, well, condemned to eternal life. And the implication appears to me that if the church had power, it would punish them in this life too. And that's, in fact, all of the story of the Middle Ages and the burning of witches is not at all inconsistent with the sort of view that Jesus puts. In the, in the Gospels. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm sorry, before I write that, did this show my mind? Well, I, I, um, I disagree very strongly with your views there. I may disagree with that gentleman on the devil and how I, uh, my view of it, but, but, but I think the hu human race does have people that are bad and good, mm. and it's your choice. Yep. And whatever that, however that may be, whether it's the devil causing you or whether it's just the way things are made, there is a choice, and in this in this life, um, somebody like Hitler making it to heaven is a torrent for most people. Like, so, and, and, and so, therefore, um, what I'm trying to, to to get at is that yeah, okay. I think I'm a liberal Christian. I, I'm, well, I hope you are. Well, we are, but <laughs> and I do I do support strongly the division of church and state. So there's many things I agree with you, and I think most people would, um, because. Um, in many respects, during that period, freedom of religion to many people meant freedom to, to impose my religion on everybody else or go away and form a group where my rules count and the other guys don't. Mm -hmm. So the element of tolerance is very important to the way we are now. And I think it does reflect, in my mind, how the church would behave before the 300 years before it became a state religion. There was a lot of debate on interpretation of scripture now nice and great, um, meeting that was actually, you know, made law, you know, became some sort of rules and some things became non-acceptable views. But before that, the church had actually survived quite well by itself, as you say, and as I think um, was now put, put out. So it's the human frailties that would cause many of your things. No, it's not Kevin. Just, sorry, Kevin. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I We're good friends, actually, and you can't remember my name. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> Go on, Peter. No, no, we're good friends yeah. too. Sorry. That's all right. All right. So so I was only lost the track. Uh, what I was trying to say, yes, uh, 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 there's many things that we would agree with what you've said, but it doesn't mean that we need to interpret what Jesus said, that um, love your neighbour as yourself. Most people, even in the Middle Ages, wouldn't have, accept, wouldn't have took, taken that view that you have. It's just simply love your neighbour. And he made it quite clear about the Good Samaritan that it could be with your enemy. Well, I, I, I get hold of the book and read the section on the Good Samaritan, and I'd hope I'd change your mind about that. Okay. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, yeah, we don't let Ray. Ray. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to say was things that you brought up as criticism in your presentation tonight. Sorry, but I'm not hearing you too much. I agree with what you said tonight very well. 
the big institutional expressions of the church down through history have not done things right. They've put very great power in bishops and popes and so on. They've put very great power in the place of kings. But right down through the age of the church, there has been a body of Christians who oppose that. It's the non-conformist church of believers who are mostly called Baptists in most places are uh, in opposition to that. And sometimes we say that democracy is something we got from the ancient Athenians. I don't really agree with that. Yes, they had some things going that were interesting, but the democracy we use today didn't come directly from them. It's actually come from the Baptists. It's come from the non-conformists who always believe we should run our country without kings and without bishops and without popes. And when the institution of the church has put these very powerful people up in high positions to rule with authority, things have been wrong. And the Baptists have learned to do it the other way. I like the way that Kevin brought out that science itself has arisen out of Christianity. I thoroughly agree with that. But I think democracy itself has too. Christians really believe in the free will that everybody has Real Christians will fight for freedom of religion for everybody. I'd just like to go yeah. back to the sheep and the goats and, que and raise the question where the judgment actually means that the person being judged doesn't have value. Mm. And I think you can look at that in the context where someone loses their life. We're talking about something that outside of this world, the loss of eternal life. So the question is how relevant that is for this world. But putting that aside, even in this world, there are situations where people either forfeit their life because they're putting someone else's life at risk and, and you know, we had a situation where a policeman was basically being stabbed by someone and, and another policeman shot the person doing that. That person lost their life. Mm. What they were doing was, was, was a wrong act that was actually taking someone, not respecting someone else's intrinsic mm. worth. But nevertheless, a judgment was made that actually terminated their life, took away some of their ability to express their value and even aside from capital punishment, there are things that we do, judgments we make as a society, which restrict people's ability to, to, to fulfil their values, perhaps. But those things don't take away their intrinsic value. And I think, I feel the same about, um, you brought this, this issue of eternal life judgment into the picture with the assumption that if God, if there's this judgment about our relationship with God, that that in a sense impugns that person's value in God's eyes. And I, the way I see it is this, God still loves the people who are judged who do not, who cannot receive eternal life. He loved them, always loved them. Jesus died for them when they were still sinners and, you know, uh, God's enemies, if you like, but there's just a need for judgment, which doesn't, and it's just the same in our society. It doesn't take away a person's value. If, um, if you watch words. any film, we want the good guy to win, mm. and we want the bad guy to get judged, don't we? But we That's a satisfactory yeah. end to the film. <laughs> but the intrinsic worth of people, we would still say yeah. the person that was doing this, that being the person who has to has to be have some um, restrictions put on them, that yeah. they still have the same value. That in the image of God, humanist yeah. or Christian, we're still saying the same. Yeah. And I believe that can be applied or does apply to God's character and the way He views this eternal judgment, which. You know, as an outsider, look at that and think this is horrific. We, we're condemning people, we're making a value judgment about them. I don't think we're making a judgment about their worth. Mm. I think it's, it's, it's about the possibility of a relationship. It's, it's, it's about the choices that have been made, which doesn't take away their intrinsic value. Yeah. And some Christians, some, some Christians will say that judgment reflects the value. I mean, you don't, you don't judge a dog for biting someone in the same way you'll judge a human for biting someone because the dog doesn't have that level of responsibility. Well, yeah. <laughs> what were you going to say, Phil? Oh, just in, in response to that, uh, the gentleman who got himself shot and then he was taking a policeman, I was just thinking, if he had written a will <coughs> after he's dead and have no value, we still will carry out that will, mm. which, in, which implies in our action that we still do value. Yeah, good, good point. So, yeah. so the point being made is, is judgment does not equal no value. Mm. I, I just had a lot of... Um, 
after all, uh, part of the, the Western notion is um, you have intrinsic value even, even when you're committing a murder. Because you can't just be, I mean, in a self defense case or a preventing crime to others, um, you may be shot without going to a trial. But if you're not shot in that particular way, you still have the right to be tried and evidence put before you and all that sort of thing. Now, in the case that the gentleman here was making, um, it seems to me that <laughs> when God withdraws from those who, no longer, who don't believe in him or don't worship him, this eternal life that you're talking about, the question here has to be whether that is a just or fair act on God's part. <laughs> now, it seems to me, given that the reason why it's been withdrawn is that people haven't accepted a certain revelation, a revelation which isn't something that you can be shown to be true by public, accessible, open information anyone can read and find as true evidence. As for example, it's not. Well, the sheep and the goats would be good, wouldn't then be a good example for what you're saying. As, as, as well, the goats are those who, well, first Russell said something like, um, when, when he went to hell, God said to him something along the lines of, well, you know, now you're in hell, now you believe, why didn't you believe then? Well, the Lord said, didn't you give me sufficient evidence? Now, all the goats could well be in the situation of those who haven't been given sufficient evidence. And it's the nature of revelation. There's always going to be insufficient evidence. It's a revelation to a person or to a small group of people. And they then have to come and find some way of explaining the rest of it that it's true. Actually, and it's always going to be a very difficult thing to do. There are so many competing revelations. Why pick this one rather than that one? And so if God should tell us to, to, uh, to take it away in the eternal life that those who believe in revelation, the revelation, um, have God. He is being an unjust or unfair God under the circumstances. I agree that if God did what you described, that would be unjust. And if he didn't take into, a, into account, you know, how, how, how well um, he revealed himself or what revelation a person had, I think, again, if there are little sketches here about the afterlife. I mean, there are Christians who argue, for example, that God doesn't take himself away. It's people, he, said he allows people to have the consequences of their own choice. And I mean, there are different ways of looking at it. So mm. rather than God, God shutting the door, yeah. the final judgment is us shutting the door on God, which you can actually see from, from you know, 180 degrees around. These, these, all these things hold together in terms of a, if, uh, an absolute reality, which until we put ourselves in God's place, um, <laughs> we can make it look really bad for him. <laughs> yeah, there's a, a basic verse in, uh, where... Abraham questions God and he says, Shall not the judge of all the earth be right? So for those who don't take hold of the grace of God, God judges them according to their works. So um, God is God of justice for them. So he will reward each person according to what they actually deserve. So now I, I also kind of struggle with the same sort of things you do. Like eternal hell, where the fire never goes out, mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing. No, it's pretty hard to tell. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 in my own sense, I can't. Um, it seems an overreaction. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, my uh, basic belief is that eventually God will be shown to be just in what He does. And uh, for the, those who believe in Christ, they receive mercy as an act of grace. It's responding to a revelation. A revelation is something that isn't out in the public realm. It's not like you, you don't see something, you don't hear something, it's something that's happened inside someone's head. It's not the sort of thing that can be the basis for condemning someone to show them torment for. Um, in, in, the, sorry, in the time when Jesus was speaking, uh, like um, if you believe the Gospels, he performed miracles, mm -hmm. did all sorts of things. And then he uh, kind of uh, uh, gave, uh, asked people to believe on the basis of what he saw then. So the people in those times did have sufficient evidence, or if the Gospels are right. And uh, probably, uh, in a sense, I'm sympathetic with you. Um, 
you can't, and I don't believe that uh, 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 any personal revelation should be binding on others. Um, and also, we, we, our organisation is called Reasonable Faith. And so uh, we're claiming that faith is not something that you just pluck out of thin air, but there is evidence for it. And um, kind of we we have been arguing these sort of things in the, in the past, and I'm quite happy to t- <laughs> um, discuss it with you in the future. Well, um, but, 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 but I, 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 I kind of agree. Like, you can't just take Bible, bang, and say, it says here in the Bible, therefore believe it. You, you naturally need to go further than that. Well, maybe you do, but Jesus didn't. I mean, Jesus is quite clearly, uh, supposedly anyway, after the resurrection, um, uh, appears in a room where Doubting Thomas is, and Doubting Thomas wants to fill the various rooms and things, and Jesus then says, well, uh, that's all very well, Thomas, mm-hmm. but you know, how much better are those who believe without any of this evidence stuff? This evidence stuff is basically irrelevant. Have faith without evidence. That's the more significant Christian position you're not. Um. I think that he's not saying they are without evidence. He's saying they're without this evidence you have had. Yeah. Oh, well, the implication is if you do it just on faith alone, you are a superior believer than someone who believes on evidence and faith. What do you want to say? Sorry? I said, come back next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, I, I, don't, I don't interpret it that way at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I, I, I don't see any merit in believing with no evidence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, what were you going to say, Tom? I was going to say, um, you were talking about revelation quite a bit, that came across quite a lot, personal revelation. And I get the impression that when you use the word revelation, you mean things along the idea of some idea that I've cooked up myself, or something that um, I've made up, something like that, that has no basis in fact and truth. Whereas when Christians talk about revelation, they're talking about genuine truth that has been revealed, which is something quite different. And if it is true, then it is true. Oh, well, I certainly can't disagree with the last one. Um, however, revelation as it occurs in, in the New Testament are things like Paul's vision on the road to Damascus. Now, the evidence appears to be that that's in, in Paul's head somewhere. He's not making it up. He really thinks it's there. Um, other people, I, I, there's some times that somebody around heard something, but the rest of them didn't see it. Um, then you have you know, other kinds of revelations like you know, Moses and the burning bush and all of those sorts of things. Um, they presumably are private experiences in, in the, yeah, it's not, not that, it's, that, that wasn't how it's presented. That may have been the case. We can't say. We can't. From this book, that is not how it's presented at the time. But the point is, we don't have access to that. Mm. Yep. When you were, you were, when I, you're talking about a very special revelation, Paul's experience on the Damascus. When I said unspecial revelation, I was meaning the sorts of things you were saying before through your talk. You know that that which is pretty obvious that we can see. You know, don't kill people. That that's that, those sorts of that's a revelation, right? So it's, it's it's a, you know, don't don't kill people. You know, you were saying you were oh. saying that the Ten Commandments are for the most part common sense. Well, at least the the, the second six of them, the first yeah. four are relating that's to how we relate yeah. to God, right? That's right. Ignore <coughs> the notion of revelation. Well, overlap with public reason. Well, yeah, because because there's general revelation, uh, if you if you want to use technical terms, which can have their value, but then they can make the conversation rigid too. But there's general revelation, so that which is obvious to everyone, and there's special revelation. Now, you you can't judge a person for for not having received special revelation, but general revelation is available to all of us. It's clear to every one of us that there are ways that we live that we shouldn't live, right? And if you're not going to respond to that, why should you get more revelation? You know, one stage Jesus says, those who have will be given more, right? And, and I understand what he's saying there is if you, if you respond as best as you can to what is obvious to you, you will get 
progressively more revelation. You know, if you if you you know if you if you're honest-hearted, you you fess up um, when you know you've done wrong according to what is clearly obvious to you, and so that's your your revelation. Then then you're on the right track for for, for deeper revelation. You know, so so there is this notion of general revelation and special revelation, and and that term. You know, perhaps you you reacted that term because it, I'm still saying revelation, but it's not an unfamiliar term within Christianity. Well, um, essentially, I'm talking about what you're calling special revelation. Um, what you're calling general revelation, I've been disinclined to call revelation at all. It seems to me it's more the outcome of people reasoning with each other um, and exercising what Kevin has, those of you talk about, sympathy for each other. So we have sympathy for each other, and when we sit down and talk to each other about how we have to organise our relationships with each other, and I say things like, I want to be free to kill people whenever I feel like it. And listen, you say, well, we want to be free to kill people too, and you're the first one to do it to. We have found reasons as to me, whoops, I'm going to change my views on that. Perhaps none of us are going to each other. It's just sort of due process of law because we can move up. Now, that's reasoning, not revelation to me. Yeah, yeah. so there's no other point in us arguing over, over words, but we're on the same track there, right? Yeah. You know, and, and, I, and I, um, the, the example that you used with the sheep and the goats, the, the judgment was based on what you're what calling common sense. Yes, yes that's, that's a really important <laughs> point. We're not talking about, in that, in that story, of God judging the sheep and the goats. It's God who's doing the judging, and He's basically saying, "I know you I know I can judge you on the basis of the way you treated other people, because when you did this to another person, you were doing it to Jesus, and you knew better. And when you withheld kindness to another person, you were withholding it from Jesus, and that's the basis on which, on which the judgment is made. And he's, Jesus is not is, is is very quick to kind of point out to people we should not be making these judgments." His ultimate judgments about people ourselves, and so whoever's without sin can cast the first stone. But like, hey, don't you think you can be God and actually judge and know the heart? It's only Jesus through other people who really knows where our hearts are at, and that is the judgment that God alone can make. So we have this idea that as Christians we should not be making judgments about other people's work. We do need, as a Christian society, to ensure that people have. They're worth recognising freedom. We need to put some boundaries in place, and that's what humans would agree with us on. But ultimately, this ultimate judgment God is making on the basis of the way we treat people is one way to look at it. And that's what that parable of the sheep and the goats is talking about. When if you read that parable, you find that Jesus is actually speaking personally and saying, it's about the way you respond to other people in this world. That's what it's about. And God is the one. I'm the one who knows that, not everyone else. Uh, we better wind up soon, but oh, I'd okay. like to kind of get a last question of you. Um, what, what do you actually think of Jesus? Do you think he was sincere, just misguided, or a nutcase? Or if you kind of met him, um, what do you think was the sort of person he was like? Huh. It'd probably be a lot like Billy Graham or something. Billy Graham, <laughs> okay. I suspect. Um, I see him very much as um, a very Jewish believer who feels that the, um, the rituals of the Jewish religion have dominated the practices of Jews without them thinking through the spirit. And, that, that's, um, and so he's essentially a reformer within the Jewish tradition who probably didn't believe most of the stuff that Christians believe today and it was invented by St Paul. Oh, right, okay, we've been through that. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. so yeah. yeah. Just before we finish up, um, some folks who haven't said anything, like, would any, any of them you like to say something? No? Sorry? Um, all right, well, I don't, I don't know about you, but I 
actually really, I really enjoyed tonight. I thought it was a, it was a really top, reasonable place tonight. Mm. Anyway, thank you very uh, much. <laughs> thank you both for yeah. coming to us. I've, I've kind of uh, erred because uh, I've, I've got uh, oh, no, a couple of these. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right then. Uh, well, if he's a uh, 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 Fears God, he'll probably uh, <laughs> share his present with you. <laughs> 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 well, he might just do it out of the goodness of his own heart.